Are you also interested in finding out what other witnesses had to say? Yes. To look in the mirror and not be able to look in the mirror. And uh, started working on October. But as soon as the grand jury was ready to disband, Roxanne have complained that this case hasn't been able to go to the next step, the next level, move away from them as suspects to intruders. And I'll say this to the Ramseys, until they produce... We've never heard it. Well, we, it's, it's who's heard it, who hasn't heard it. Six people have, and the fact is there are signed affidavits to that effect, which is the same as, as testimony taken under oath. The professional careers of every one of these people is on the line with this, and I've noticed... Well, for instance, I've always said the Swiss Army knife that I hid, uh, put away in a cupboard, there's only one person that would have found it, and that was Patsy Ramsey, and they found it in the room where they found John Monet. I got nightmares in my head, I fear thoughts build up until I can't my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper I got nightmares in my head, I fear The thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science The most authentic voice in true crime I'm guessing this interview where you can see the Ramsey housekeeper holding up a sample of handwriting from the ransom note and comparing it to Pat's issues, holding it up to the media, I think it occurred somewhere between 2000 and 2003. Linda Hoffman Pugh worked for the Ramseys for 14 months and was their housekeeper at the time six-year-old John Bonet Ramsey was killed. The Ramseys also suggested the housekeeper as a potential suspect to the first officers on the scene. We know that very early on the Ramseys suggested, based on the police assumption that the crime had to have been an inside job by someone who knew the inside of the house or had been inside or because they knew where the writing pad and pen was, knew where the basement was, knew where John Bonnet's bedroom was, knew where everyone else's bedroom was, that it had to have been an inside job. And who was a better insider than the housekeeper? Another reason it had to have been an inside job was all the killing tools came from inside the house. And so whatever happened to the inside job theory, amnesia, before we get to the rest of this analysis, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you're enjoying this analysis, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So the housekeeper needed money. That was the story that Patsy told, and I believe it's true. You know, there's, there's no better um, kind of narrative than one that is based on, well, let's put it this way, st uh, staging is, is all the more believable when it's based on some reality. And is that the case here? Uh, because Linda Hoffman Pugh had said she needed money, and she did need money. And so doesn't this elevate her to a likely suspect? Well, then the question becomes, does her handwriting fit the, you know, uh, does it match the handwriting of the ransom note? Does her DNA match? Also, does she have an alibi? And what do you think the answers are? I mean, she's a very obvious suspect, but she's also very easy to exclude on th that basis. According to the book by Lawrence Schiller, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, he writes, Linda Hoffman Pugh had asked to borrow some money just a few days before. Linda also had a key to the house and had major money problems. And perhaps if you think about it, why is this amount in the ransom note so small? And so the ransom note writer may have thought, well, let me try and, you know, perhaps implicate somebody else. Um, let me also come up with a scenario that's not very believable, that's kind of simplistic. According to Schiller, Patsy had planned to make out a check for $2,000 that morning, the day after Christmas, and leave it on the kitchen counter for Linda to pick up on her next scheduled cleaning day, which was December 27th. Later that morning, the police would obtain copies of checks endorsed by Hoffman Pugh from the Ramsey's bank for handwriting comparison. The Ramsey's housekeeper, 
would actually become the first suspect. Now, within a stone's throw of the ransom note was a cupboard with checks for several thousand dollars made out to John Ramsey. Have you ever seen this footage? What better place to leave a ransom note addressed to John that once that, that requests a specific relatively small amount of money? You know, what, what, what is a better place to leave a ransom note? I'm talking about in a stage scenario than a ping pong ball's throw from the, those checks scattered um, all over the nearby shelving. A brief recap of the media narrative involving the housekeeper shows her various efforts since the grand jury trial was completed in 1999 to sue both the Boulder DA and the Ramses. Why? Because she wanted to be allowed to tell her story. She wanted to publish a book about the case. And I think she probably could have gotten a very handsome book deal, except for the fact that, well, at the end of this process, because she was a witness in grand jury proceedings and because those proce proceedings are secret, and because of the laws in Colorado, the housekeeper's efforts to write a book about the Ramses were finally shut down in August 2003. But just look at this media narrative. John Bonet's maid sues to reveal info. That's from 2000, the same year. Ramsey housekeeper suing to break silence. And this is an excerpt from that article in the um, Denver Post. Quote, Pew initially contacted Hoffman, that's the man that is standing beside her in the footage, Donna Hoffman, because she was considering filing a libel lawsuit against the Ramses for naming her as a suspect in their recent book, Death of Innocence. The U.S. Supreme Court overturned a similar Florida law in 1990, arguing that the individual's First Amendment rights were more important than the state's interest in preserving the secrecy of a grand jury, according to Hoffman. Well, guess what? That didn't fly in Colorado. Then in 2001, Maid sues Ramsey as another suit is settled. Then in 2002, Hoffman Pugh actually sued the Ramseys and lost. And then in 2003, the Ramsey housekeeper was found to that, that she couldn't discuss grand jury testimony. That came out in 2003. So what's also interesting with the housekeeper, who has always suspected Patsy, is that she, and wrongly in my view, I think there was some um, involvement. Personally, I think the, that Patsy was involved and the, the grand jury indictment um, reinforces this. So I think that there's some element of justification for the housekeeper's suspicions. But I certainly don't think... I don't take it as far as she did. You know, she believed that that Patsy killed John Bonet. I, I don't agree with that. But what is interesting is that she mentions Burke's Swiss Army knife in this interview, being in the basement near John Bonet. That's actually a very important piece of information well, in for itself. Well, instance, I've always said the Swiss Army knife that I hid, uh, put away in a cupboard. There's only one person that would have found it, and that was Patsy Ramsey. And they found it in the room where they found John Bonet. The housekeeper seems to think this implicates Patsy, but I think it only implicates Patsy so far as Patsy giving the knife, one assumes, to Burke. I mean, why would Patsy take Burke's knife and do something with it when she could use a kitchen knife? Anyway, did the knife get into the basement because Patsy took it there or because Patsy gave it to Burke and Burke took it there? What do you think? Also, what significance is there to a knife in the story? The duct tape on John Bonet's mouth, if I remember correctly, I, I could be wrong, appeared to have been cut with a sharp object, such as a knife, as was the nylon cord on John Bonet's wrists. But the most important thing regarding the knife is the question of the whittled handle on the wooden device that, that bears an uncanny resemblance to a Boy Scout tightening stick or a toggle rope. I'm not going to take it further than that, but I will be expanding this analysis just to look at some of the tabloids that came out immediately after the death of John Bonet Ramsey. So look out for that. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.